This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. of you. It's possible that you'll become so wealthy in the first 10 years you never have to work again. But generally, if you're a driven entrepreneur and a type A personality, even if you end up creating that sort of wealth, you'll end up working for the next 40 years anyways. And the entrepreneurial experience is a journey where you will make lots of close friendships. You will do a lot of things wrong. You'll notice that I'm follically challenged on the top of my head, and I'm only 26 years old. And that comes from all those times in my life when I pulled my hair out on mistakes that I made when I was running my companies or I was running a division of a large organization. And in particular, again, many of you people in this room are, are engineers. I would encourage you to make sure that when you get out in the world, practice your engineering skill sets. Make sure you get some time working on developing and shipping a product. But then go and try to do something different. Go take a sales position. Go become a, a director of marketing, product management. Learn those facets of other parts of an organization because in the end that will make you a better entrepreneur when you can understand wing to wing of what's required. Now with that, what I'd like to do is turn it over to some of the USB, USCSB alum. They're going to spend five minutes each talking about their journeys and then we'll go to some Q&A. So Dan, if I can ask you to maybe tell a little bit about what your uh, experience was like as you left the university. Is the introduction of my background came to you is I came out of a, a really high academic level heading into you know, academia as a PhD student. Uh, went from there and actually joined an academic position at USC Medical School. My area was biomedical engineering mm -hmm. and is what I was working though there was no formal programs in that here. It was kind of I got to generate my own program. It was really had a lot of freedom in those times mm -hmm. to do it and, and was lucky to get into an area that's something that was brand new. An area that was getting a lot of interest and it dealt with lasers, electro-optics, that type of thing, light-activated drugs, and so there was a great opportunity. Uh, I spent five years in academics at USC uh, Medical School and uh, Children's Hospital in LA. During that time, I just, you know, like you said, to go ahead and experience it, but discovered I didn't care to be, the academics wasn't my future. Uh, there are all kinds of issues related to, as there is in academics, as there is in corporate as to why, and made that decision at the time that, that I wanted to step outside into entrepreneurship. And then that was in the mid-80s, and it was going strong at that point in time. The entrepreneurship was a big thing, and there, everybody looked at the, as you said, the one who had the lucky stick out there and the opportunities. And we were developing technology that had some demand out there. People were wanting the technology. It was something that was going. So the opportunity led, did a lot of consulting for big companies uh, while in academia, which is normal. But out of that led the opportunities to make the move. So I decided that five years into the academic ladder program, decided to step out. Um, but it was like you said, it was an opportunity and I and it had to take a chance. What was the biggest difference you found between being in academia and then going into the commercial world in terms of how you had to think and look at opportunities that might yeah. be in front of in you? In the academic world, it, it, you know, it runs on publish and die uh, mm -hmm. routines from, a, from an academic ladder standpoint. But it was, you know, much more basic and where me from an engineering background was much more to applied. Mm -hmm. I wanted to apply the technology to a problem. Uh, and therefore, out of, comes out of that, it comes opportunities in terms of products. So that's really more of an engineering focus of not basic science, but problem solving and productizing. Um, and working within, having a chance during those five years to work with industry on a consulting basis, really get, started giving you an opportunity to see where what business was about. The biggest, hardest transition of doing that, of course, is stepping out. I, being single, I could just step out. and I didn't have any obligations or anything else, so I could just step out and not worry about it. But realizing at that point in time, 
I knew nothing about business. Uh, I knew nothing about reading a, a financial statement or a, a balance sheet or any of the things. And I can remember many stum stumbles I went through in that process of getting educated. Well, how did you educate yourself? You're no longer in uh, an institution like UCSB where you're learning. You're now out in the real world. How did you uh, continue your personal education? It was a, a lot of bootstrap. I mean, the company was bootstrapped uh, at those days. In those days, we could do it. There was nothing going on. We were lucky we could do it that way. And it was really by surrounding myself with people of other experience, mm -hmm. marketing people, people that knew, you know, accounting issues, you know, doing inventories and, and all that type of things. And we're familiar with how do you fund and capitalize a company as you go forward. So it was really uh, uh, through, the, through, you know, learning the hard way. And did you, some big mistakes. Did you have to? Well, well I'll ask you in a second about your mistakes. <laughs> um, did you have to go raise venture capital money? Were you involved in that process? We eventually did. Uh, we eventually did get into the capital business, but it was a number of years through the process um, of being able to... Um, I, I was lucky in the sense that I had invested in a company that had been bought by Johnson & Johnson, mm -hmm. and that gave me a nest egg. It wasn't a big nest egg, but it was something to work with, so we didn't have to go mm -hmm. right out and raise capital. But many years down, when the business grew, we had to, and eventually the company went public. And so to get there was venture capital plays a key role in that process. And what was it like that day your company went public? <laughs> it was uh, it was an experience to watch something of a value. I mean, to suddenly see a value jump. Come a lot of realities with it, though. You know, you see it on the market, and you see the numbers go up and down. And in those days, the IPOs were hot, and things were moving up quick out of an IPO. And then you'd see it drop back down for some other reason, and realize that. Uh, you know, it was very paper. Mm -hmm. It was a very paper thing. As a major insider, the largest stockholder in the company at the time, you couldn't do anything. You know, it looked great on paper, but you were constrained. And did it change your life, how you lived your everyday life on a daily basis? Not initially. Not initially. I mean, you, one thing in, in doing an entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur in Enig, I mean, you live the business. There's no 40-hour weeks. There are 120-hour weeks. There are eight days, you know, seven days a week. 24 hours a day, you live the business. You, that's what it takes to do it. You focus, you, um, you hyper-focus to get success. And that's what you have to do. So it, it didn't change it because it just kept right on going. And when did you step out of your operating roles? Stepped out of my operating role 12, 14, 13 years ago now. And do you miss it? I did initially. Uh, I found it hard, and my wife said it was a major adjustment in my life. <laughs> she said she got close to divorcing me out of it. But uh, <laughs> she said it was, uh, you know, it, I remember one time she said, I scheduled three things at one time, and she got so mad. She said, I'm not your secretary. <laughs> said, oh, but it, so it's a, it was a major adjustment moving from the operational role into what I'm doing now, which is more uh, seed round, helping early companies get started and bringing them up through those early development stages, which is the one I, that's the area I like. When it gets big and operational, I tend to leave. All right. Okay. Now, Allie, you started your company three years ago, excuse me, six years ago. Seven. Seven years ago now. Yeah. Okay. And, and um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the idea and how it came up for the company and what it was like for you to be a, a new college grad or not even a college grad coming up with a new company idea and that process that you went through to building the company to where it is today? Sure. Um, so I was a student at UCSB, like yourself, kind of interested in business and entrepreneurship. Um, I was an economics mathematics major and uh, I was looking for more. I felt like the economics department was um, very theoretical and I knew that that wasn't something I wanted to do long term. So I started you know, looking at other areas of the department and stumbled on what was the SEAM program and now is the TMP program and really just started attending the lectures and getting involved. And at the time, you know, I was a sophomore. I did not have any idea that I was going to start a medical device manufacturing company. That, I mean, was completely outside of the realm of my thinking of what I was looking for. Um, and as, as you said, I kind of stumbled upon that. That wasn't something that, you know, I said, I'm going to set goals and this is my goal to uh, achieve. So really, 
our enticement was we wanted the $10,000 to win the business plan competition. We were just students who said $10,000 would be great to have. So, so that's, that's really what enticed us to even start looking for ideas around us. And uh, the, myself and the two other founders said, all right, let's go on winter break. And over winter break, let's try and think of some ideas. So we all went home for winter break. And I went back to my hometown. And my grandmother was there. And she had just been put on oxygen three months before. And I saw the limitations that she had with the device. You know, the, the traveling, if we can go to, uh, out to dinner, mm -hmm. or you know, all of those challenges that she was now facing on a daily basis that really destroyed her quality of life. And I actually didn't even come up with the idea. She did. She said, why isn't there something better? Everything else, all other technology has gotten lighter, smaller, better. Why isn't this 50-pound machine smaller? And so I just took that back and said, well, maybe it could be smaller, lighter. Right, I want to make sure I understand this correctly. You're probably 20-ish years old at the time. 19. You're a math, 19. You're a math and econ major. <laughs> and your grandmother's complaining about her oxygen device. And you decide, hey, I'm just going to go solve this problem. <laughs> well, I, not exactly. <laughs> you know, I took it back to the other two teammates, and I was definitely on the accounting finance side. And they were medical device experts? No, no. So the other two students, one was actually another mathematics economics student, and another was a biology major. So okay. we had no engineers, no medical device, nothing. Um, but we said, well, why isn't there something better? And uh, we just started looking around and saw there wasn't anything better. And we actually, uh, one of the first things when we said we should pursue this, maybe we should call the people who actually make oxygen concentrators and ask them why they haven't made a portable oxygen concentrator. And they were it's small. And they were willing to take your calls. Oh, yeah. They all took all our calls. And what they said was it is physically impossible to make that device. And that was kind of crushing, you know, as somebody saying, thinking this was a potential idea and something that could work. And the people who are experts on the technology saying, no, physically impossible. The physics will not allow that small of an oxygen concentrator. And as a math major and an econ major, you knew they were wrong. <laughs> I hoped they were wrong. <laughs> so, and so, so, so now how did you guys then approach that? You decided you wanted to keep on going. We, we tried to get back to their assumptions of why they thought that it was physically impossible. Because we looked around and could say, you know, there are a couple key things that we know could be smaller. And when we got to the root of why they told us it was physically impossible, it was because they were constrained by cost. They were thinking about the device in terms of the commodity business that was there, where they had to build the device for $150. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't use fancy technology in a $150 box. So when we were able to figure out a model that would allow enough cost in the system to support mm -hmm. a high-tech device, then we could actually pursue the development of the product. And did the three of you design the product yourself? And just money rained in from venture capitalists who's looked at these smart kids from UCSB <laughs> and said, here you go, here's $15 million? No. Um, <laughs> it, it was actually really hard. And I, it's probably very similar to what you guys are experiencing right now, where we are in a recession. It's a bad time to go out into the job market. And when we were looking at starting this, uh, we won the business plan competition in May of 2001. Um, and we then had no idea how we were actually physically going to make this product. We had concept drawings, and we had general ideas of the technology, but we had never made one or even made oxygen yet. Uh, and oxygen is a complicated pro process. It's mm -hmm. a chemical process that you separate the oxygen uh, from the air through a a crystalline structure. So it's not easy to even do the basic setup. Um, so we actually just started, eat, we started simple. We said, well, let's just keep talking about it. Let's work with our network within Santa Barbara through the, the uh, entrepreneurship program and say, um, let's keep looking at it. And the two judges of the competition took an interest in the project and um, 
they actually, one of the judges ended up becoming our first CEO, and the <laughs> other became our first angel investor and our chairman of our board. So now, this guy, gentleman, becomes a CEO. Did he raise the money, or did you, your, the founders, go out and raise the money? Uh, it was actually a she. A she, she, excuse me. Um, she uh, joined the company, and actually, we had already gotten the first Series A closed um, right at the same time. Okay. Basically, the Series A wouldn't come in unless we had an experienced CEO. Mm -hmm but the CEO wouldn't come in unless we had a closed Series A to pay her. So it kind of all had to happen right at the same time, and neither one of them would do it unless we had a way, a, a plan for designing this product that we had never built and had no experience and had no engineering talent to do. So uh, all three of those things kind of all had to happen right at the same time, which is not easy to get them all to correspond. Um, and this especially was right after September 11th. Uh, so the m money was not flowing. Nobody wanted to invest in 19-year-old students from a college who couldn't even commit full time to the project because we said, well, we still have two years left. <laughs> so um, you know, it's going to be rough. So let's fast forward to today. <laughs> um, how large is the company? Uh, we have a, about 55 employees wow. right now. Um, product is shipping? The oh, product. no. We've been shipping for yeah. four years now. Yeah. Uh, we have about um, 15 to 20,000 units out in the market. We ship worldwide. Um, and we've raised about $58 million in venture capital. That's a lot of money. Yeah. It's a lot of other people's money. <laughs> 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 All right, so, so Davis, you're the, the, the most recent grad. Tell us a little bit about how you got involved with Active Life and, and how that's uh, sort of taken over your uh, entrepreneurial journey for the last couple of years. Right. Well, it, my story follows very well with yours that never, things never go as you planned. So I had actually initially came to UCSB partly for what was then SEAM and is now TMP. Uh, I was an ambitious high school student who was really wanted to get involved in something entrepreneurial, but wanted to stay on the technology side. So I spent my high school spring break and came down here and visited. You know, what a horrible spring break in high school, right? <laughs> Just wandering the halls of the engineering building and happened to stumble upon what is now TMP. I was sold that day. So I came here knowing that I didn't necessarily want to graduate with my engineering degree and then become an engineer. I was much more interested in the entrepreneurial side. So I did everything that I could to take advantage of the extracurricular activities that related to business and entrepreneurship. And it was really an outgoing, ambitious kind of uh, motivating factor that I had to tell myself, OK, I'll only go to three parties a week instead of seven, <laughs> and I'll go out and do some business stuff. <laughs> Tough decisions had to be made. <laughs> but. I continued and stayed involved, and it ended up being through my network of contacts, um, actually through the technology management program, that I was introduced to this concept, which has now become Active Life Technologies. Um, I never planned on starting a company straight out of school. My plan had always been to work for a startup and get that experience after I graduated and then start my company. But you know, I didn't want to turn down a great opportunity that was introduced to me. And so the latter half of my senior year, I had to focus full-heartedly on convincing a world-class inventor, a world-class uh, university, and uh, to allow me to license the technology which was invented here at UCSB by a physics professor named Paul Hansma. So then to license that technology and start the company, then I had to convince friends, family, and the other F, the fools. We had no fools in our investor portfolio. <laughs> a very small amount of investment so that I, we could actually start the company. Um, so we ended up doing so in July of 2007, shortly after graduating. I did so with my uh, co-founder, Alex Proctor. How much money did you raise from your friends and family? A little over $100,000. It was really just enough to pay the patent expenses. And, and what was it like asking your friends and family for money? It, it wasn't very hard, to be honest with you. Um, I, a, a lot of friends and family came to me and said, how can I help? Okay. Um, and I think that partly came from the fact that they saw my track record as a student in college that I was very dedicated to whatever I put my mind to. Um, that I, I did take that extra step, that I did focus a lot of my time on preparing myself so that one day I could start my own company. 
Does it make it stressful today to have those, you know, talk to people about how the company's going and when the company has ups and downs, knowing that they've given you their hard-earned money, that they sweat it over and they gave it to Davis, whom they trust? I mean, what's it like now when you have to have those conversations with people when not everything's always going as well as you hope? Yeah, I, I feel a, uh, a serious commitment to these investors. I mean, it's my job to return the investment to them plus some. Uh, but in terms of the ups and downs and do I ever get a little uh, concerned, no. I mean, I have confidence that we will prevail. Um, you know, it's, right now, it's in terms of strategy. How can you survive in a market where venture capital is not very easy to get at all, uh, especially if you've never received any, where getting angel funding is probably not very likely as well. So what can you do? Um, we started out as a medical device company. You have to get a lot of money, millions of dollars, to go through your FDA clinical trials, to get funding, to build the company. So we found a market that didn't require that. And we're actually selling some of our prototypes right now and getting early feedback. So to us, it wasn't a matter of will we disappoint our investors. It was how will we not disappoint our investors? How will we keep this going? Uh, it required a big change in strategy. Nothing ever goes as planned. I, I, big theme, I think, of tonight. Um, but we ended up, you know, we're, we're still there. We're still alive, and things are actually going fairly well. All right, so I'll ask, I'm going to ask all the panelists a question. I'm going to start at the end with Davis. What is the biggest mistake you think you've made in the last three years, and what would you choose to do differently uh, mm -hmm. where you did X and you wish you had done Y? I think at the very beginning of starting the venture, we did a lot, uh, uh, way too much thinking. We tried to plan things out and say, okay, hypothetically this, hypothetically that. And again, nothing ever goes as you plan. So I wish I had taken the initiative much earlier and just gone out and done things. Because mm -hmm. you can't learn from something any better than just going out and trying it and learning from your mistakes and learning from your successes. All right, Allie, how about you? Probably the biggest mistake and what cost us the, what wasted the most money was we actually, I think, grew too fast and mm -hmm. tried to be a bigger company than we were. And uh, before we actually had, you know, we're at a point where we had the revenue to support that. We started trying to be bigger, put in a bunch of processes. We are a medical device company, so there's a lot of, uh, policies and procedures and regulations around what we do, but we tried to be even bigger. And we tried to be first class in the sense of being a big organization when really the benefit that we had was that we were small mm -hmm. and flexible. So um, we burned too much cash on investments in things that really weren't important until a later date. So uh, despite your desire to do the right things right, I'll borrow on an old Intel expression, mm -hmm. You kind of lost your way, perhaps, for yeah. a little bit in terms of forgetting that part of being an entrepreneur is being flexible, right. understanding that you can be quick. And there's times you want to focus on certain things, and there are times you might have strategic neglect. Yeah. You should just say, we're not going to do this now because it's yeah. not necessary. And I think that was something that was really hard for us to say, we're not doing these things. We tried to be everything to every area of the business that we could as quickly as we could because mm -hmm. we thought that was success instead of really focusing on what do we need to do right now to, to get to the next step. And I think that focus would have, uh, would have cost us less money in the long run. And how about you, Dan? Some of the bigger things that I've seen that have, have led to failures in the last six, seven years have, have been the thing of being defocused. Mm -hmm of not realizing, I mean, you've got to get focused on what it is, maybe it's like you said, one certain thing that you need to get done and get that focus and get down and not allow yourself to get de too defocused and accomplish a certain thing that gets you to the next level. That's what I've seen as most important in, in a company is to succeed or to fail if they don't do that. Now, when you look at focus is critically important, especially when you're dealing with the type of economy that we're dealing with yes. now. If you're a student who's graduating, 21, 22 years old, you're bright, you're coming out of a great school like UCSB. What could you do to a potential future employer or to a company if you're looking to start it that can help make yourself successful? I think with the TMP program, it's why I've always been a good supporter of it. I think we, it was, didn't exist, and so consequently, like I said, a lot of it was bootstrapping learning issues. 
about business market analysis, <laughs> spreadsheet, and you know, all the types of things you didn't have. Engineering weren't exposed to that back mm -hmm. there. I think, as you know, when you go into industry, you end up getting exposed to that stuff out of necessity. Um, so I think the people coming out of the programs today are going to, this type of program will be much more, much more valuable to a startup since they know, they have familiarity with that stuff, they can understand it and work better in the team situation today. Now, Ali, same question to you. you know, what do you think, if somebody were coming to interview with your company today, how could they set themselves apart that it might give them the chance to join your organization? What I really am looking for, and, and Inogen does hire a lot of, of UCSB grads and people who have you know, been at UCSB at some point in time, uh, She'll be taking resumes right <laughs> after the panel. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what we really look for is people who are enthusiastic about wanting to help the company succeed and can be flexible. For a startup, things change constantly. That is status quo, that things every day are going to be different in a startup environment. And people who can accept and thrive in that mm -hmm. type of environment and drive that change, because change is needed in those types of situations. So those people who can uh, be OK in that environment maybe don't know everything that there needs to be to know about a topic, but are willing to just jump right in and get things done. Uh, a startup is not a place where you have, you, you know, as Davis said, you can plan it all out and it all, all goes exactly to plan. And you, know, you're, you learn, you know 100% of the information that you need to know in order to make a decision. You know maybe 20%, and you take a good guess, and you see what happens, and you have 30%, and you make another decision, and you keep moving it forward, So, uh, especially in the early stages. So um, I think it's important that all, all of the people who are looking for jobs stress the, the flexibility and willingness to, to change and grow with the organization. Yeah, it goes back to that point. You're all significantly closer to the beginning of your career than the end of your career. Uh, you know, Dave, a same question for you, right? Um, you know, if you were looking to grow active life and you were looking at some students who might be coming out, what would be the two or three key attributes you'd be looking for in a potential right. uh, and I can, I can give a good team. answer because we're actually not hiring, though we are offering free internships. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested, I'll take your resume. No, um, so maybe I'll answer it in two ways. So one would be if we were hiring, what would we look for at this point in mm -hmm. time? So at this point in time, we have three people in our company, myself, my co-founder, and the inventor. Uh, we would be looking for somebody who is well-versed in not one specific area, but somebody who can wear several hats of responsibilities within the business. In very, very early stages of companies, you end up doing just about everything. And yeah. I've heard stories from Ali <laughs> of, of such. So we would be looking for somebody who not only maybe understood a little bit of the science and the engineering, but some of the business. How do the finances work? Why do we need to save money at all costs? Sales and marketing. So everybody kind of works together as a team. Um, so kind of a, a note on that, as a, an engineering student going through the program here, had I just stuck to the recipe that the College of Engineering laid out for me, I wouldn't know anything about business. I wouldn't have learned anything about a financial spreadsheet, about marketing, sales, what the heck a CEO even does. So I had to go out of my way and take that extra time and extracurricular uh, activities to figure that out. But it, it goes the flip way as well. If you're somebody who is more of a business background and has no technology background, it's, it's just as hard and just as easy to learn about technology and become familiar with the language so you can communicate that and participate in it. So now the other answer to my question, so if I were a student trying to get a job, any job, but specifically at a startup, what would I do? I wouldn't think of it as an application process or an interview, I would think of it as a competition. Because that's really what it is, it's a job competition. You are competing against everyone else that's in this room who's going to be hit hitting the job market, and you have to prove to the employer, the potential employer, why you are the right person. So if you take that different kind of frame of mind when you're approaching the interview process or application process, it might help you a little bit in terms of gaining, uh, figuring out where your competitive edge is. And if you think about it, the entrepreneurs have put their blood, sweat, and tears into this. They've taken their family's money, venture capitalist money, and they take very seriously their commitments 
to the other employees. So if they look to add a team member, they're looking for somebody who's going to add value to the team and who wants to be there. You know, Davis, I'm going to come back to you. We'll come back this other way. You know, one of the things I want to know is, is if you could do one, let me rephrase this, if you could do more or less of something since graduating, what would you change? Now that you started the company, if you could say, you know what, I wish I, over the last two years, had spent more time mm. doing this, or conversely, less time doing something else. Hmm. You know, oddly enough, I would say I wish I spent less time listening to other people. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. So, as so they can all leave? <laughs> <laughs> Class dismissed. But, but you, know, take, you can take advice or you can leave it, but make up your mind quickly. When, um, when I first graduated, I made a, a quick, very quick transition from being, being a student to being a business owner, CEO, and a co-founder. So I still was in an awkward transition point of feeling, OK, I'm kind of still viewed as a fresh student to all of these business advisors who I'd worked with in the past and mentors and, and TMP. But at the same time, I'm now responsible for this organization that we've started. So I guess I'd wish I had gained a little bit more confidence in my ability to actually go out and do what I was doing and less sitting back and listening to other people. Um, I think that it was a little bit slower of a transition. Now, more on a, a, a practical side, something you can put your hands around. Uh, when we got our office, I was just trying to find somewhere that was close to walking distance to my home. You know, it's really nice to not have to drive. We found a good spot, but we didn't really take note that there were no windows and there's no air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> we have one little skylight, and being an engineer, it took me a year to figure out how to open that thing. So, <laughs> How about you, Allie? I, I mean, I would completely agree with Davis on listening less to other people. Um, and I know it's really weird to say, especially in this type of environment, but it, it did seem like in the beginning, we didn't trust ourselves enough. We thought, what do we know about any of this stuff? We don't know. So we must be wrong by default. <laughs> and it was a bad assumption. I mean, we talked to a lot of advisors and a lot of people and the hardest part is that you're starting a company. There's not a black and white answer. It's not just mm -hmm. like, this is what you're supposed to do, and, and you go do this, and you will be successful. And it was hard to wrap our arms around the fact that we had you know, 10 different people we would talk to about what we should be doing and what they thought about this idea or that. And we would get 10 completely different answers. And most of them contradicted each other. So it was the, that type of thing where we went, wait a minute, none of them agree. And these are all smart, successful people. And it took us too long to realize that everybody is very influenced by their own experience and what's mm -hmm. happened in their industry and their career, that it doesn't necessarily apply directly onto what you're doing. So I do think it's good <laughs> to, to you know, hear stories and hear how people have handled different things. But in the end, you have to make the decision. And it's not right or wrong most of the time. 90% of the time, there's not a crystal clear answer. So you just got to do what you think's right and, and move on. Got to trust your gut. Yeah. So, so Dan, I got to ask you, you've spent the last 12 to 14 years <laughs> advising companies. And do you really wish that the CEOs that you help listen to you less? Do you think that's the right <laughs> advice that you want to kind of give out? Do you agree with our your colleagues yeah. on the right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I've got to think back, because I've got to remember back being to where your position <laughs> versus being where I've been for the last 14 years, which is putting the investment money back <laughs> involved on the other side of it. Uh, no, what you're saying is true. I mean, I can go remember back to those days. Of, you know, you get a lot of input, yeah. and you get at things. And I had one guy tell me one time. You know, I had a guy who worked for me, and he was helping to raise capital, and he went out and, and he did all this stuff, and he had never raised any capital. And then a bunch of things happened, and he left, and I went back to these people that I met from him, and they said, "Why didn't you ever invest?" And he, they said, "Well, we liked you, we liked the business, but we didn't like him." <laughs> and he said, "But you chose him, so we didn't going to say anything." It was kind of like, okay, he was trying to you know, think it through too hard and working it too hard. Focus is one of the things I always think. That, you, know, I, I looked, you know, you ended up going a lot of different ways and mm -hmm. coming around, and yeah, you made mistakes, especially if you didn't have experience, you made mistakes. And, but, you, but you really move hard and fast. Opportunities are, are usually windows in, in the business. I remember when I started my company, I had 
finished graduate school and was about four years out and left Intel and I, me and a buddy started the company and I drew the short straw and became the CEO. And what was weird <laughs> was, was for the first year and a half, what I realized is everybody was telling me what I should do, but nobody told me what to do, right? Because once you're the CEO of the business, you know, you report to the board and you report to the shareholders, but you're the boss. And it takes a while before you get comfortable enough in your own skin that you're going to be making decisions. Uh, sometimes for people who are your age and soon sometimes people who are older than you. And getting that confidence is a very, very kind of difficult thing to do and knowing to trust it. Now the other side of it, says the venture capitalist, <laughs> is I'll go back to the comment about my being follically challenged or as a close friend of mine said, she likes how I dye my beard gray now to give me that sense of being adult supervision. <laughs> that there are a lot of mistakes that people have made that if you sometimes <laughs> listen closely, you can be sure not to repeat the same mistakes that they've made because everybody's run through it before. Mm -hmm. And so you know, the ability to kind of keep your composure when times are down and when times are tough, and times will be down. You know, those are the types of things where putting good mentors around you can help be a calming influence in what's going to be a very turbulent time and a stressful time, you know, especially coming out in this environment. Now, I'm curious to all three of you, you know, Seven months ago, we had global financial Armageddon, right? You know, Wall Street was melting down. Um, everything was terrible. It was the worst Christmas season ever for, for shopping. And, and, and is it all getting better now? The stock market's back up. You know, is everything rosy? I mean, from what you see, are they coming out now and they're going to catch it all on the upswing? I mean, what do you guys see in your businesses and, or the, you know, the company, the businesses that you're managing? managing. And we'll go across this way first. What do you see? Is, every, is it still terrible and horrific? Is it getting better? Is it mixed? I think it's it's getting better. I mean, it, it, the shock of the whole you know financial system collapse really put everybody, even from a private investor as an angel to, to the ventures, to just stop. You know, they wouldn't they wouldn't stop and they just weren't going to do anything. I mean, mm -hmm. it just it was, the uncertainty was too great. And what we're starting to see, I think, starting to see now is an interest. People are starting to get back into the game. Not completely, but they're starting. And so you're seeing people, and I, and I think you're starting to see in economic things that people are starting to think about what they're going to do with their money. You know, not just doing bank and where they're going to invest it and in what they're going to do. And so people are, and people are starting to buy things. I mean, that was a whole thing companies weren't able to sell. Right. I'm sure you're using them. You've seen sales go way down during this period because people just stopped. So I think it is turning around. It's kind of, it's, I think it's on the bottom. It's going to have some more bumps, but I think it's starting its way back up. Now, how was your business impacted, right? I mean, people need oxygen. So it's not something they can do without. Were, were you guys, you know, completely unaffected by what was going on? Or did the bottom crater on you too, and it's still cratering? Is it getting better? You know, from your perspective, what's it like? Well, oxygen, you do need oxygen. Mm -hmm. The people who are on oxygen need to be able to have access to some type of product. But what we found is, they don't, in, in times of crisis, they may not need a luxury oxygen product. Mm -hmm. And that's what our product is. Our product provides freedom and mobility for patients who want to be active. Mm -hmm. And it does cost a lot for a product that, you know, they say, well, it's really nice and it really improves my quality of life, but do I have $5,000 to spend on something that I could get from uh, my insurance for free in mm -hmm. a much less portable form? So um, that was harder for us. We were already kind of in a process of, of shifting our business a bit to take into account more of an insurance-based system. Um, but uh, yeah, it did affect our business, and it was something that we had to step back and say, are we doing the right things? Is our strategy right? Mm -hmm. Do our investors support us? And we, we actually raised a bit more money to make sure our cushion was there. And even though it is an awful climate to be raising money, every single one of our venture capitalists participated in the round and continued to support the company. So we took that as a good indication that they are supportive, that this long term is a good business model and a good direction uh, that we're going. Now, was the raising money a painful process with the existing investors, a one OK sort of process, or they just kind of agreed to throw money at you because you were all smart? people seem like it was working well. Well, we, we've done this quite a few times now. This is not a new process at Inogen. Um, so it, it wasn't a, a, you know, a thing where we went, oh, we have to raise money. It was kind of like, yeah, we have to raise money again. Mm -hmm. um, and 
our investors knew why we were raising money. We had a very good reason why we needed this specific money and how it was going to help the long-term value of the company. So it was not a stressful right. round. It mm -hmm. was a round where we said, this is why you're giving us the money. Do you agree that this is a good use of capital? And they agree. Yeah, and I think that's a key point that it's something that we're seeing as well. Good deals are getting done right now. Mm -hmm. The valuations might be a little tougher than the entrepreneurs would like, but you know, the capital markets are way down across the board. And, and you know, even the venture capitalists who wish the valuations were up a little bit so they could write up their portfolios. But good deals are getting done right now, and we're seeing that happen. How about you, Davis? Is, is, is it s still a real fight and struggle, or because of your changing your business strategy, are you a bit sheltered from what's happening out there? I'd say we're a bit sheltered. So fortunately for us, so just to give you an idea of what we do, we have a, a scientific instrument that can quantify touch. So, and we're not just talking about skin and bone, we're talking about micro level of touch that you can't sense by just squeezing something. So that has a lot of different plays in testing bone, cartilage, any type of human tissue that becomes fibrous and can die. So we are currently selling to researchers. So it's not an FDA regulated market. And lucky for us, the one body in America that can legally print money is supplying our customers with money right now, researchers. <laughs> The government. The government. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, there was a point in time where a lot of people we would approach and say, you know, we have this new tool, it's showing promise in these areas, and try to sell them and, and sell the whole perceived value of it. And they'd say, look, I'm, my budget's frozen. This was earlier this year. It's when all of the mm -hmm. departments came together and said, we're not spending any more money, we're, you know, mm -hmm. take out your own garbage, everything like that. <laughs> now that this stimulus package has come in, People are writing grants left and right, and <clears throat> you know it's raining money in, in this industry. So, so stay in school. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so in, in terms of, of that market, it hasn't affected us quite as much. In fact, we sold the majority of our five prototypes when the economy was in a slump. Okay. Uh, now, what if we were approaching venture capital? Uh, like you mentioned, deals are still getting done. Good deals are still getting done, but I think the definition of good is what would need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. So yeah. for us, we believe we have a very promising application. But the market we're addressing right now is not your next billion dollar market. And based on our experiences, a lot of VCs are looking for the home run opportunities. They're taking less risks on something that might take 5, 10, 15 years to come to fruition. And something that's a, a lot more of a duh, a lot more obvious that you can you know, less risk. It's, I think, does that sound about right? Yes, I, I concur. I have one final question for each of you before we move to the audience for uh, allow you guys to all question the panel. Um, I'll start at you, Davis, at the end. What do you enjoy most and least about what you do every day with your job? I would say the thing that I enjoy the most is waking up in the morning and knowing that I have no idea what I'm going to experience that day. Well, yeah, I have a general idea, <laughs> but it's always something new. I enjoy learning, mm -hmm. and this is a field that I had no background in. So every day is a learning experience for me. Um, I enjoy the people I work with, and I enjoy the vision that we have created for our company. When you are working towards something that you feel is actually going to have a significant impact on something, whether it's a person, uh, an organization, a body, the world, it's a very gratifying and, and satisfying uh, feeling to wake up in the morning and go do that job. It doesn't feel like work. Seven days a week, 14, 16 hours a day, I'm not kidding, it doesn't feel like work. You enjoy it. Uh, what do I enjoy the least? I don't know, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, I mean, uh, anything that we don't enjoy, we find a way to enjoy it. Um, we have what, uh, maybe I can give you an example. Sure. Alex and I work together, we share an office. So oftentimes we'll get so deep into something that we're working on and then we want to ask one of our, the other person a question. And so I'll be working on something financially, this, that, this, and that, and I say, I'll just blurt out, Alex, how much did that cost? And like, how much did what cost? You know, <laughs> we get so ingrained in what we're doing. So. We, uh, we have what we call the curse of knowledge nerf gun. <laughs> so if you do that, if, if you blurt out a question or you say something without it fully explaining yourself, you get shot with a nerf gun. <laughs> um, so things that end up getting in the way or bothering you or become hindrances, we make it 
a, a fun way to get around that. So if there's something that I'm not enjoying, You or, shoot people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So, in our company, there were four of us in a room, not much bigger than, say, this area up here, and the engineer next to me every 20 minutes ago, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. I, you know, my heart would stop as a CEO, and then you go, oh, wait a minute, never mind. You know, and, and, and that happens, right? And you learn to put up with each other's, you know, yep. for a while. Allie? Yeah, uh, you know, probably what I enjoy most about my job is the level of responsibility I have at my age. Um, I do feel starting a company and uh, getting the experience that I've gotten, you have to take on more responsibility in a startup. Every single person is critical in a startup environment. So you get more exposure, you get to do things that in a large company, you're going to be pigeonholed into this small little area. You're going to do this, and you're going to do it every single day, and nothing's different. And I really enjoy that I've been able to have a wide array of experiences throughout the entire business. And I also, not only have I been able to experience it and see what's happening in those areas, I own them. You know, It's my responsibility mm -hmm. to get these things done. And I feel that's something that it's hard to find. It's hard to find at a young age people willing to give you the chance to succeed or fail. And the one thing you'd take off your plate if you could? Oh, it would be accounting. <laughs> oh, my God. But, but hold mean, on. You're the VP of finance. I'm CFO, okay, I'm yeah. CFO. Okay, just checking. <laughs> yeah, and, and accounting. I mean, oh. I, <laughs> I, accounting and all of the rules and debits and credits and all the little minutia of transactions and what you have to do. That's, that's something I would love to get off my okay. plate and just focus on the fine. I mean, the fi to me, finance and accounting are two, two different th worlds. It's not the same as much as yes. somebody says, you know, oh, well, mm -hmm. yeah, your number's people. No, <laughs> completely different. Very different. And Dan, what about you? Most favorite, least favorite? The most favorite thing I like now is working with young companies. I mean, that's, uh, having been there and now being in a position to go out and work with them. That's the fun part. That's the reason I stay in, seed, in the seed part of the business is you get to work with new people who are just starting and you know from experience and what they're going to go through and building that relationship and working with them. That's the part I really enjoy. That's, that's the fun part. It, to me, that's the fun part of the business, to see it come up and grow until it gets to the 100 people and it gets to be a main <laughs> headache. <laughs> one of the hardest things and all these things is people dealing with people. Yep. It's people skills. Because um, no matter what you're going to do, you can't do it alone and you're going to have to interact with people. Agree with them, disagree, whatever. So the, the worst thing for me is dealing with government regulatory <laughs> issues. They are horrendous. I've been in the medical, being in the medical mm -hmm. field is one of the worst, but there are other ones in other fields as well. And I find that's the, you know, I'm a, I'm a true market capitalist and believes that get the government the heck out of the way. Yeah. Uh, but that's, that's the thing I wish I could get rid of. And consistent with why Davis changed his uh, product strategy or his go to market strategy with his product. Yeah. And before we turn to the, uh, to, over to the audience, a couple of final comments. You know, hopefully there are a few themes that came out of the last hour, you know, a few that I caught. Um, everyone talked about the importance of flexibility and that no matter how good a plan you've laid out, it's going to change. Mm -hmm. And make sure you're comfortable with that if you're going to go into an entrepreneurial setting. Uh, the second one, you know, I want to highlight was trust your gut. There's a balance between trusting your gut. Make sure you surround yourself with good mentors. Good mentors will give you good advice, but at some point you're going to have to stand up and lead. That's part of being an entrepreneur. And so at that right time, don't be afraid to call the ball. And, and the last thing is there's no right way. You've got four people sitting up here who all have taken very different paths and very different journeys, um, but who all can probably relate to certain common things that we go through. Mm -hmm. And whatever path you go down, don't worry that your friend or your buddy has done something different. Uh, take your own path and, and make the most out of it. And no matter what you do, make sure you enjoy the process. And with that, why don't we open it up to the audience. Does anybody have any questions for the panelists? Question is, as your companies grow, or when you're researching new ventures, um, how do you weigh the quality of talent and research that's available in California versus the much more pro-business regulatory climate in states like Texas? Anybody want to take the first shot at that? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to do so. if. Uh, all right, well, my, well, well, no, go ahead, Dan. I think, well, California from a technology base is, is, is very high. 
I mean, there are many resources in, in Santa Barbara, having involved a number of companies that started in Santa Barbara, the resource technology you can pull in Santa Barbara is amazing. And uh, so that, that part isn't, you know, is, is good. I think California is very good. Um, the business side, as, as an early business and a thing, it's not too much of a problem as a small early company. I think you'll see as, as you get into bigger companies, that tends to be the issue and you see why so many companies end up leaving Santa Barbara even. You know, they get to a certain point, they get big, and they, it, the reality is they end up leaving. They move the company somewhere else. And that's, that's the pro-business issue of, of California than yeah. other countries and states. Yeah, I was going to say, what yeah. has been California's greatest strength, and I would suggest are places like this, the, the disproportionate number of top research institutions mm -hmm. that continue to turn out mm -hmm. uh, good uh, quality work. So in S Southern California, you go from UCSB to UCLA, USC, Caltech, UCI, UC San Diego. In the Bay Area, you've got UC Berkeley, Stanford, uh, UC, uh, UC, UCSF, UC Santa mm -hmm. Cruz. So you know, you've got a, just a disproportionate geographic concentration of uh, great research institutions and the surrounding infrastructure that goes with it, financing, legal, accounting. So from an entrepreneurial environment, and you also have you know, this unbelievably strong magnet of people from all over the world who come to these research institutions. So to date, we're still pulling the best of the people from on a, on a global basis because of our universities and the, and, and the ecosystem around it. And as a, as a selfish venture capitalist, we, I'm support, we're supportive of more immigration, right? Continue to bring good people here to start more companies here. We'll create jobs here. Now, as things scale, it's not just comparing to Texas. You're comparing to what's going on in Shanghai. And so when I was at, at General Electric a few years ago, I had divisions working for me in Luzon, Switzerland, in Taipei, in Shanghai. You know, you, and for me, as the, as the general manager of the division, all I looked for is where could I do whatever skill set needed to be done in the right location. So I did software engineering and design work here. I did manufacturing in Asia. I did that my high-end systems work in Europe because you went to where those skill sets were. Mm -hmm. So you know, California itself is is there's a lot that's for it, but it will continue to evolve. Um, I don't think we'll ever be a manufacturing powerhouse again. Though I will say this: there are more manufacturing jobs in Los Angeles County than there are in the entire state of Michigan. So when the government is thinking about bailing out Detroit, we should all be asking about what's the state of California getting. Mm -hmm. that's good. Right, other questions up here. This is for uh, Ali, right? Mm -hmm. um, you said that you handled all your accounting and stuff like that. I want to know what kind of software you started with, and then since then, have you moved on, and what you moved on to um, to track your finances? Yeah, so we, we actually took uh, what I would say is a little bit different of approach. Uh, typically, right when you start out, you usually start out with QuickBooks or something like that. Um, we went to a local accounting firm, uh, Bartlett, Pringle, and Wolf, and said, we don't have any money for an accounting system, but could you work something out with us? Um, and we didn't want to go the QuickBooks route because we knew it was just a short-term solution, especially since we knew we were you know, going the venture capital route. Uh, what we ended up doing was they kind of rented to us on the side um, great, uh, it's small business manager, it's a Microsoft product that then transfers into Great Plains accounting software. Um, so it was great for us that uh, a local accounting firm, and I found when you make those local connections, uh, they are much more willing to work with you and know you don't have money to spend $30,000 on an accounting platform, and that's a bad use of capital. Mm -hmm. So in order to become our, um, our firm at the time, they, uh, they would do this kind of side deal that really isn't normally done mm -hmm. um, to get us some software and get us up and running. So that was our plan, and now, now we're on Oracle. And if I can just add something in there. Uh, so being from computer engineering and my business partner physics, we had no finance background other than the TMP class we took. So the approach I took is what I call Ali books. <laughs> Ali was a, a mentor for me when I went through the business plan competition. And I don't know if you remember this, it was probably a week before I had to submit my final plan. I'm like, Ali, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I, I don't know anything about finance. I don't, are these realistic numbers? And she's like, calm down. The answer is no, they're not. <laughs> but I just got a very simple spreadsheet and it was somewhere to start. 
And so I kind of built my knowledge from there. So for those of you who aren't accounting majors. Call there, Allie. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there is hope. <laughs> and, and I do want to say, I mean, I was not an accounting person either. I was you know, an economics, mathematics student. I took two accounting classes, and that's it. That's the entire extent of my accounting uh, education outside of what I had to learn on the job. And mm -hmm. I've done, you know, the controller job and really diving wholly into the accounting world. And, you know, you just learn by doing. Mm -hmm. All right, so Bill, I think we have time for one more question. It looks like there's someone over here, please. Um, I found an interesting contrast between Inogen, which you would express as you felt grew too quickly, and Active Life, which I believe you said still only has three employees. <laughs> and my question to you is how do you feel you can best balance growth with the costs associated with it and when the best time to start expanding your business actually is? Well, I, I mean, I think the first thing is do you have access to the capital? If you don't have access to the capital, then you can't grow fast. And even with Inogen, you know, raising as much money as we had, have raised, we still have limitations on how fast we can grow um, based on the capital that we currently have. So um, it, it's a balancing act, and I think it's different for every single new venture, depending on the size of the opportunity, depending on the risk involved. Um, companies that are, you know, medical companies require a, a larger upfront investment. And so you need to see that bigger return, which means you need to kind of risk more in that transition of saying, okay, now we're going to sell. We need to go big. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have time to grow a little slower, spend less in the beginning, you don't have to have those crazy projections and try and go mm -hmm. faster. Dan, what do you tell your companies? Well, I think it's, it, 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 it's What's the opportunity? I've had a number of companies that I've put money in that have failed, that have missed <laughs> opportunities for one reason or another, not getting enough capital mm -hmm. at the right timing and into the market, and the market window moves. Um, so it's, it, it really is the individual situation. Some things have to grow really fast. I agree they'll be better and stronger if they can grow slower. Yes. And more appropriately, and because I don't, you grow too fast, you get a lot of weaknesses mm -hmm. in your business. Um, it just happens. But, it's the opportunity and, and, and the capital available. When capital is available and good, and the old, what's the old saying? When you can get it, take, take it. it. Fill your take can it as much as you can get when you can take it, when it's good. Fill your canteen when you're by the river, not when you're thirsty. Yeah. Now, what about you, Davis? What would you say? Um, yeah, as being a company that's three people, and we've been around for two years now, um, I'd say capital is one thing. I mean, we certainly aren't making, uh, I'm not making a CEO salary right now. Um, but that's okay. Uh, I would say that one thing that we've noticed is or that I've, I've noticed as getting out into the entrepreneurial community, a lot of time companies will speak of growth as, or speak of success as how many employees they have in their company. Oh yeah, we're at 50, we're at 100 people now. And really that doesn't say anything to me about their success. How much revenue do you have per employee perhaps would be a better question. Mm -hmm. So for us being small with three people, we're quick and nimble. We can change directions really easily. We can adapt to the market. When the economy took a dive, it didn't affect us like it did a lot of other companies. We didn't have to shut our doors. So choosing the right time to grow and making sure that you can support that growth is very important. I think that's yeah. what we said here. And one final thought I'll add, you know, having worked both in large companies and, and in startups, even in large companies, at G General Electric and Intel, I had infinite capital for all intents and purposes. But there's a discipline that goes into the thinking about how you're going to spend and when you're going to see the returns and what's the incremental return on the next dollar spent. Mm -hmm. So as you go through your entrepreneurial journey, so one thing I'd also you know, uh, encourage you to think about is maybe you'll start companies straight out of school. But sometimes you might be able to go to work for a large company and you can learn the right way to do things. And that discipline that can be learned at a large organization will translate really well for you when you start your own organization because you'll learn how to do the right things right. And on that note, I want to thank our panelists for making the time to come tonight, and I want to thank all of you.